with Ryanair's low fare flights. Sunny spells on scattered showers tomorrow, highest temperatures of 14 to 18 degrees. And now you're up to date on News Talk. Your chance to win big. News Talk's cash machine. So we got a massive amount of money to give away in the cash machine on this post-bank holiday week. It's a nice, easy one to remember. €75,000 exactly. Text play to 57557. That's 57557. Get your entry in by 3 o'clock tomorrow. Then across the Go Loud network of stations, Barry Dunn makes that call. If the phone rings, answer within five rings. Tell him the exact amount. It is €75,000. Over 18s only. Text cost 250. Terms and conditions are on Newstalk.com. The Football Show on Off The Ball. With Sky, all the football you love in one place. Across Sky Sports, BT Sport and Premier Sports. This is News Talk. I prepared to end it I can't well, do it then. Again. Do it then. What about your start to the game? I was, it wasn't bad, was it? <laughs> Why should be an honest answer be a mistake? How can a modern day manager not have a mobile phone? Why should he? Oh! It is Thursday's football show. Nathan with you this evening. We're going to chat to Aoife Mannion, who is a new recruit to the Republic of Ireland side, a Manchester United centre half, and uh, born in Birmingham, but very much a male woman. And she's going to talk to us about her career a bit, a bit later on. Uh, Jonathan Wilson is with us right now, though. How are you keeping, Jonathan? Yeah, not too bad, thanks. How are you? Uh, Brighton nil, Manchester United nil. Second half just underway. Pretty entertaining first half. Are you watching this? I'm actually watching the Udinese Napoli game. I, I had a feeling, I had a feeling. Because uh, Napoli just need a point to to, to seal the uh, Scudetto. And I, I don't know if you've been following it, but they were they were 1 0 down for a long time. Victor Osserman has just scored, so it's 1 1. And I, I think what happened is that the ball he scored with has been taken off and immediately put in a velvet bag, presumably for safekeeping in case wow. that is the. I mean, because when, when I saw the ref taking the ball off, I thought, oh, the ball must have burst, which is quite weird that it's burst just in the moment of scoring. But then, yeah, what, I think he was a Napoli official, put it in a velvet bag. So presumably they're keeping that for the club museum as the uh, the, the the ball that, with which the goal that's won the title uh, was scored. Well, it's going to be valuable. You don't want some guy just getting it as it's put out of play for a throw in and it never returns again. Well, it's, it seems a very sort of um, very Italian obsession with relics. I don't know. That, that was what, was what occurred to me. What's the value on that sort of football? Yes. Oh, I mean, in Napoli, in Naples, it must be must be enormous. I, I mean, I don't know if they've got the ones of 87 and 90. I don't know. You'd, you'd think you'd hear about them, right? What I do know about um, the, the... This is a very odd story. But the um, when 89-90, uh, uh, when Maradona clearly his cocaine issue was, was pretty bad... He would escape the drugs testers. He had a had a fake penis with a with a with a bladder attached, and he'd fill that with somebody else's urine, and squirt that. And um, then, for, for whatever reason, in '91, th- this went wrong, and he, he did get caught and gets the ban. But his his fake penis was taken to Argentina, and was uh, was in a museum in Buenos Aires, and it went on a nationwide tour in I think 2000 or 2001, and was stolen. <laughs> uh, so. <laughs> I, I just think there's a, there's a brilliant podcast series to be done, you know, in in, in search of Degas Maradona's fake penis <laughs> and Bobby Moore's jersey. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's a very odd story as well. That that's gone missing, yeah. Uh, wow. I, yeah, I would listen to a six-part documentary series on Diego Maradona's missing fake penis. Yeah, well, who that wouldn't? Could be, that I mean, could be your next book, surely. <laughs> I mean, I do, I do mention it in Angels of Dirty Faces, but if anybody wants to pay me to, to go and do the full investigation in, I've no even, I don't even know in, where in Argentina it was, but um, presumably not Buenos Aires. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm very much up for that if any producers are listening. The stadium in Naples is pretty much full tonight, it seems. They're showing the match on a big screen. Uh, I think most people who like football would like to be there this evening in some ways, but in other ways, I suspect it's going to be a little bit chaotic. Yeah, I mean, it, it's been pretty crazy there for, for for quite a while. I mean, I guess the title's been effectively sealed for sort of a, a good month or so. I think that victory they had over Juventus, uh, what was that, the weekend before last, mm. I think that was when they sort of thought, right, e- even Napoli with all their sort of uh, demons that need slaying, all their superstitions, you know, even they can't can't mess it up from there. So it, it does, from what you hear, it does sound like it's been been constant celebrations for the last 10 days or so. Uh, Victor Osiman got the goal you mentioned, so he's on to 22 league goals this season for Napoli. He, I expect, will be the centre of a lot of speculation across the summer. There's talk of Manchester United potentially being interested. Uh, from 
what you've seen of him at 24 years of age, just how good is he when you look at the top strikers around Europe? Leaving Erling Haaland out of it right now as a comparison. Yeah, I mean, which is fair because I think he is on a totally different level to pretty much anything we've ever seen before. Um, well, look, there's a caveat that is Serie A and we've seen people like Lukaku score loads of goals in Serie A and then it hasn't quite worked when they've, in his case, returned to the Premier League. But yeah, Osserman, um, he he's a... I, I think the number nine is coming back, at least uh, in a, in a sense that the, you know, we, we I think we've gone through our phase of false nines and and attacking you know, or wide forwards. I think the Holland is is part of a, a move maybe back towards more traditional centre forwards. I think probably more mobile, more versatile than than, than previously. But he, but he does seem to have those virtues of a of an old fashioned number nine. He is good in the air. He is strong. He's good with his back to goal. He's got pace, really good finisher. So I, I think he's, I think he's really exciting. And I think he's the most exciting African striker we've seen for a long time. Which, in terms of the Cup of Nations and in terms of Nigeria, I think is is hugely important as well. Mm, I think he's now the record African goal scorer in Syria in a single season, maybe surpassing the last great one in Samuel Eto'o. Unless we're including uh, well, Lukaku yeah, in there. Yeah, I, 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 I didn't know that stat, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think Eto at the minute is still a better player that. Um, I guess the, uh, Mineta was at Inter, but obviously, yeah, the, the the peak of his career came later with Barcelona. Um, I, I guess a, a more physical striker than Eto. Um, I mean, Eto. I think the thing with Eto that it's it's very hard to sort of map in stats. Is his movement was so good, and I mean, I remember I was in um, I was in Cairo in two thousand and six. And uh, I hung around the Cameroon Hotel a lot, begging them to let me interview with Eto. And eventually they'd, they'd let me go up to his room. And it was after training, he'd gone to bed. So he was just lying in bed. But he was watching, I, I don't know, I, I don't even know what it was, but some North African or, or, or possibly West Asian, some, some Arab League game. And it was a terrible standard. He was watching that when I went in the room. And uh, so I said to him, you know, what, what is it you're watching? And he, he said, I don't really know. I just know it's bad football. I'm like, why, why are you watching it then? <laughs> And he said, because yeah, I, I I need to to work out where the space is against bad defenses as well as good defenses. And I thought that was such an interesting insight that yeah, if it's, if it's not just one run is the right run, wow. your movement is different according to the the level and, and type of team you're playing against. Yeah, geez, that level of obsession is probably not something from afar you'd associate with him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it sort of really impressed me because I, I think yeah, you think of him as being maybe slightly flash. I think there was lots of stories with Cameroon that. Yeah, he sort of tries to sort of um, assert his, his sort of authority there by giving them all watches because he could afford it. Um, but I, I think he had a very, very sharp football brain as well. And if the fact that he was able to, you know, when Messi came through and Messi started playing as, as that false nine, the fact that he was able to switch and play on the right, I think that suggests his intelligence. And I remember as well that 2010 semi-final second leg at, uh, at the Camp Nou when, you know, when Inter lost 1-0, but that was enough to take them through. And when uh, Thiago Motta was sent off, Eto immediately, without having to look at Maria, Mourinho said this is when he knew he got the team trained properly, was that he dropped back to play right side midfield and Goran Pandev dropped back to the left side midfield and they instinctively went to 4-4-1 without having to be told to do that. And you know, Mourinho said that was when I, I knew that I'd got the, the the mindset and the team right, they were making the right tactical decisions. So I, I think Eto was a, a, you know, a very, very tactically astute player as well as having the pace and the finishing. When you talk about uh, the traditional number nine maybe coming back and like Hallam being the prime example, when you're looking around Europe tactically, are teams using that number nine in the middle of a 4-3-3 is, or is two up top coming back? No, I, th- I think it tends to be the 4-3-3. And I think you'd still want them quite mobile because you, there are a you know, huge academy seem to spew out thousands of these um, very good technical attacking wide um, forwards. So yeah, the, the likes of Salah, I, I, I guess, would be the the best example in a, in a Premier League context. Um, I, I think your way you see it is if you if you look at Bayern this season, and the fact that they don't have, I know they got cheaper Martin, but they don't have a really really elite level centre forward. They really miss Lewandowski in a way that I didn't think they would. I think Nagelsmann didn't think they would, uh, and I know it's partly Bayern yeah, briefing that. Yeah, when they're being asked why didn't you sign a replacement for Lewandowski, it, it is partly their their spin to say, well, Nagelsmann said he didn't want one, but I, I think I think he probably didn't. I think 
you know, the, the nature of Nagelsmann play is he, he hasn't really used one before. Um, and and I, I think you know, that, that very fluid, very flexible front three is is probably what, what he thought he was he'd be best served with the Bayern um, mm. and it, it hasn't really worked for them I think you know, they're, they're, they're big problem is they create chances but they're not finishing them but, well it does put an awful lot of pressure on all of those players to score goals we look at Arsenal this season and the way that those three of Martinelli Odegaard Saka all well into double figures now can ease the pressure when Jesus isn't there and I guess that's the conversation we had all season around Erling Haaland that look at the dipping goals from everybody else at Manchester City since his arrival but I guess that conversation is dead in the water now as to his well, importance. Uh, it, it, it's yeah. I mean, the last six weeks they played so well as a as a team, as a unit. I mean, I, I think they really have worked that out. They've got that balance right, and I think it's it's been the you know the 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 fascinating tactical thing from City this season. The the fact that Guardiola want, wants control. That's the way he's always played. Is 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 try and stifle the game. Try and try and absolutely control it through possession. But Holland needs the ball forward quickly, and even in the Community Shield, you could see immediately that that was an issue that wasn't quite gelling. And that first half of the season, it didn't gel, and, and there was games they got away with because Holland scored brilliant goals. There was games they got away with because they're just a really good team and lots of really good players. But it wasn't the same level of uh, of authority and, and 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 fluency we're used to. And then it it seems to coincide with with Cancelo leaving. Which is a surprise. I, I think certainly before the World Cup, you'd say Cancelo was arguably the, the best performing City player. But him leaving, uh, using Ake at left back, he obviously doesn't get forward as much. He, he's not making that run in field. I think Grealish is happy with that. And that's like opened up the the, the, the possibility of a, of a better relationship between Grealish and Holland. Uh, I think uh, De Bruyne and, and Holland and De Bruyne had that post World Cup dip as well. Uh, I think they're now, yeah, that that, that that relationship is very solid. I think, yeah, there were signs of that early in the season, but really the last six weeks, two months, it's really, really come together. And you look at City now and you sort of think, well, how do you stop them? Um, yeah, previous iterations, you thought, well, they will dominate possession, let them have possession and just hope they don't take chances. But Holland will take chances. Uh, and then that's... Yeah, you know, when when defenses focus on him, it creates chances for other people, whether that's Mares or Grealish or or Julian Alvarez. He got the guard of honor last night onto thirty five league goals or passes, Shearer and Cole. Historically, when you look at this thirty five league goal, fifty one goals in all competitions, still has potentially what nine games left this season to get to sixty goals in all competitions. Which saying last week, it's like. The Dixie Dean number was always something that felt like from a, a different world, a different sport of the 1920s and in no way relevant to modern football. Like when you look at all the great strikers that you've been watching over 30, 40 years, like, is this just something you never thought you'd see? Yeah, I, mean, I guess we've been softened up to it slightly with what Messi and Ronaldo have done in Spain. But mm. certainly in a Premier League context, you sort of thought, yeah, 30 goals per season is... I mean, I think he's only the fifth player ever to even get 30 goals in a season. So in fact, he's on 35 with... Uh, was it six games remaining? Five games, six games go, to go, isn't it? Mm. Uh, no, five, five, five games, games now, five, in now, five yeah. in the league. Um, so I mean, you'd almost think he's more likely than not to get to 40. Um, and, and yeah, I, mean, I remember when, when Clive Allen had that season when he got the 49 in all competitions in 86 7, and you sort of, I mean, obviously, I was a kid at the time, but you thought, then this is this is incredible, this will never be repeated. Um, and I, I'm sure that uh, Pongo Waring fans, uh, they, they they thought their man's record was safe, and and now that's gone. So, yeah, it's I, I you know I thought I thought he'd be good this season, and and yeah, everything I'd seen of him at um, at Salzburg and, and and then at Dortmund, yeah, I, I sort of thought yeah, there's this 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 combination of physical power, pace, technical ability, it it, it I don't I, I you know the only equivalent I think I've seen was Brazilian Ronaldo before the injury. Probably more pace than power, but but you know, he had the power as well. Um and I really think there's only maybe been half a dozen forwards in, in the entire history of football that have had that combination. Um and, and and what what's happened to the others is they've always got injured. Mm. That there's been something because they are so physically freakish and their bodies haven't been strong enough. You look at Holland, there's absolutely no sign of, of any sort of since he's overstraining his knees or anything like that. So 
um yeah it's a, it's a it's an extraordinary thing to witness yeah you you think in football you've you've seen everything and then suddenly you see something that's it seems so simple and yet is is so so different and nobody's looking at this and thinking it's not repeatable next season. As you said, aside from an injury kicking in, like it feels as though if he stays fit next season, yeah, you know, we'd be expecting something similar. Oh, you'd almost be expecting him to, to better it because mm. I think you know, City as a whole have got better at uh, you know, working out how, how best to use him, how, how best to marry that with, with the control they have. And uh, you know, I think from a from a Champions League point of view, I think that's really interesting. The 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 sort of about tension between Guardiola's instincts and you know his his theory, and, and then the the sort of the the, the 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 almost sort of brutal simplicity of what Holland does, and I think that tension has been very creative and very productive. Um, we might not be saying that if they lose to Real Madrid, but but at the minute it feels like you, I just don't know how you begin to set out to stop this city. So yeah, ne- next season, you, yeah, you, you there's no reason for him not to match it, and if if anything, he may go beyond it. It may be if Guardiola lets him play 65 minutes a game rather than 60 that he can you know hmm. he can go even further. It, quite often, when a team or a player is as brilliant as this, you sort of think in the second season the opposition, the level of coaching is so good now they will figure out a way to stop him. And it's probably only been one what week long spell this season around the time of the Everton game, and he seemed to be losing his temper a bit and. Defenders are getting in close to him and winding him up, and you kind of <laughs> so, thought, Whoo. So, hang on, is your argument that Frank Lampard is a man who can stop him? I'm, I'm just saying, <laughs> run, me, run with me at this one. Uh, but aside from that, where he had one week where he looked a little bit annoyed with life, but still scored, I'm fairly sure, in that game as well, uh, that no team has figured out a way to really counteract what he's bringing. I, I don't know how you do because. You know, if you put a quick player on him, he'll, he'll beat you for power. If you put a powerful player on him, he'll beat you for pace. And if you put a quick and powerful player on him, he'll beat you for skill. So I, I'm not really sure what what you're supposed to do. I mean, maybe maybe Peak Van Dyke could have could have had a good one on one battle with him. Um, but yeah, you, you look at how he. I know Rob Holding is not the world's greatest defender, but the way he just sort of brushed Rob Holding off for that first goal uh, in in you know, when in the in the four one win over Arsenal. I think the vast majority of defenders find themselves in that position. So you think, all oh, right, we'll we'll put two men around him, three men around him, but then you're just giving space to other City players. And yeah, this is City. Obviously, have yeah, you know, it's, it's fast out to say, but they have brilliant players in all positions. So you can't be giving them space. Listen, Jonathan, what he hasn't faced is a manager who's really at the cutting edge. <laughs> <edge. laughs> that that's at the very top. There's nobody <laughs> ahead of in footballing terms. Not Pep, not Klopp, not Arteta. <laughs> None of these guys. And on Saturday afternoon, he's going to come face to face with Sam Allardyce and a Sam Allardyce defensive <laughs> setup. Uh, you, you, I, mean, I, you, I can't wait to see it. Yeah. This is, you know, the this has been, you know, the, the writing on this this season of the Premier League has been just brilliant. You know, Todd Bowley is is a great character. You think, you know, he, he, the cameos have been great. You know, Nathan Jones, what what a great cameo that was. Oh, you know, Nathan cameo that's, that's sort of stolen the season. And then, um, <laughs> yeah, this sort of East Enders Christmas special style sort of all all your favourite old characters coming back. You've got Roy Hodgson back. You've got Frank Lampard back. You've got Dean Smith back. And now you've got the biggest of them all, Big Sam back. But Big Sam without Little Sam, because <laughs> the, 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 the ridiculous detail of him being on jury service at the time. Which is it's and yeah you know, that that very sort of poignant line of uh, of Sam's yesterday. Uh, <laughs> he loves being with me, and I love him being with me. And <laughs> yeah, you know, so but the, the narrative power of Big Sam without his one tree love, trying to take on Erling Haaland and mes- maybe resurrect the title race on Saturday. It's it, you know. It, 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 would, it would be one of the greatest moments of football history if if if, if they oh my god else. if they were to somehow go and win that game I I would assume the odds are more uh, favouring a seven eight nil Manchester <laughs> City victory it, like there's clearly no shortage of confidence and never has been with Sam Allardyce when you do look back and you know Bolton does a very good job gets them into the UEFA Cup Newcastle doesn't really work out but Blackburn probably starts to build that reputation on being able to keep a team in the Premier League does all right at West Ham. Obviously, the England thing is in there as well. Like Sunderland keeps them up. Very good. No, very good at Sunderland. I, I mean, Sunderland in, in the summer of 2016 were in as good a position as they've been in for 20, well, in the last 20 years. Uh, 
And if if he hadn't gone to England, then yeah, I, I think Sunderland's recent history might have been very different. That the way he he turned that season fifteen sixteen around with with four very well, four signings in January, three of them turned out to be brilliant. One of them was fine. Um, but yeah, he he knew where the players were. He needed. He went out and got them, and he he he, he got Sunderland playing in a very very effective way. And I think Sunderland fans were were, were very very sad to see him go. So. Um, it's sort of 50-50, I think, among the the, well, the eight previous Premier League clubs he's managed as to whether fans liked him or not. But, yeah, I, I, I think he's a little bit... Uh, yeah, I, I, yeah there's, there's, there's two things going on. There's, there's his opinion of himself and there's a public opinion of him. And somewhere in the middle is the, the truth of where he actually is. Uh, yeah, he's clearly a very gifted manager. Let's, yeah, let's not forget that in terms of data analysis, in terms of use of cryogenic chambers... He was actually a great modernizer. You have this idea that he's sort of, you know, some some dinosaur still still lumbering the fields of Dudley, uh, you know, left over from the last ice age. It's, it's not entirely fair. You know, he 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 was very, um, you know, very very much ahead of his time in his time. I just fear that time may have passed. But for a four game, what can you do? The dice, what can you do? Games against Newcastle within forty eight hours. New, uh, or sorry, City. Then Newcastle the week after, and then West Ham. who didn't yeah. like him as well. Yeah, and, and the thing, yeah, you know, if, if if he does get something on Saturday, the team that benefits most is Arsenal, who pretty much hated him because they saw him as being sort of the the bully boy who kind of you know tried to kick them off the game. So it's it's just a a, 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 a denouement of the season that could have been very anticlimactic. Has suddenly been enormously enlivened. God, I forgot about the Nathan Jones era. Those were glorious <laughs> days. Oh, the, I mean, some of the greatest press conferences the Premier League's known. Until until Sam returned yesterday. Until Sam returned. Yeah. Nathan Jones doesn't even get the best press conference of the season anymore. <laughs> Dear God, it's still scoreless between Brighton and Manchester United. There are 65 minutes gone in Brighton. Uh, it has a weird sort of end of season feel to this even with the way Sky have approached it and uh, putting cameras on players heads as they walk onto the pitch and uh, cameras inside the dressing room at half time and it's been very open but it's still scoreless uh, what's the latest for Napoli? it's still 1-1 uh, uh, and with, that'll do it uh, yeah there's eight, well, uh, seven and a bit minutes of, of normal time to go and then whatever's added on alright we've got to leave it there Jonathan great stuff cheers thank you uh, Jonathan Wilson with us there uh, we are going to talk to Aoife Mannion in a moment and we keep up to date with what's going on between Brighton and United Football on Off the Ball With Sky Don't miss Liverpool versus Brentford on Saturday Night Football Live only 